Well, it's been a long time since I've made my last video and some of you are probably wondering what's been going on. Well, the answer to that is a heck of a lot. So we're going to have a lot of videos coming up soon where we're going to be talking about what's been happening in my hiatus. But let's get to the topic of this video. Did my 200 series do a second engine in 12 months? And I know some of you are going, wait, what, you blew up the first engine? Well, it's a bit of a long story. So I guess before we go much further, we should probably talk about what happened the first time around. So I bought the car Christmas Eve 2019 and it made it the 260 odd kilometer trip home and then it dropped its guts. Unfortunately, it sprung a leak out of one of the high pressure injection lines. And anyone who knows anything about common rail diesels knows that there is a heck of a lot of pressure going through those lines and therefore a heck of a lot of diesel came out. It was quite horrifying. You just couldn't have poured it on the ground as fast as it came out of the injector line. We had the car towed to a local mechanic. The car dealer that we purchased it from got them to have a look at it and diagnose the problem. The local mechanic pulled off the engine cover, had a quick look around and quickly diagnosed that one of the injector lines was leaking. They took the injector line off, cleaned up all the threads, checked everything out, put it back on and hey presto, the leak went away. The disturbing thing there was that all of the injector lines had chemipen numbers from one to eight. And that means somebody had been in there before. Now it's my understanding in hindsight that the reason that they had taken those injector lines off was probably to do a compression test. They probably thought that there was low compression in one of the engine cylinders and I'm assuming that they discovered that was the case and therefore they quickly traded it in. Now to the dealer's defense, they obviously didn't realize this was the case. And I didn't realize this was the case because the car ran and drove fine. It didn't have a miss. It didn't seem to use any excessive amounts of fuel, but it did have a little puff of smoke on the highway that you could see when you were following it just every now and then. Now this puff of smoke was probably that one cylinder that was low on compression. Now we didn't discover this until after our first trip away. When we returned, we discovered there was a heap of oil on the back door of the car. So I immediately got underneath and had a look around for the oil leak because if you've got oil on the back door of your car, you must have a pretty major oil leak. And unfortunately for me at that time, there was no oil leak. In fact, it was completely dry underneath the car. The oil leaks came after the engine rebuild. We'll talk about them later. So with a huge amount of concern, I contacted the dealership and said, hey, look, we've done 700 kilometers in this car and we have oil all over the back door and there's no oil leak. So we drove the car back to Perth and they promptly took it to a Toyota service center and had Toyota have a look at the vehicle. They did a compression test and diagnosed number three cylinder as low compression. They never told me what it was, but obviously it was bad enough that the dealership decided they were going to get the engine rebuilt. Now, of course, when you spend a lot of money on a vehicle like you do when you buy a 200 series Land Cruiser, this is not the news you want to hear. But thankfully, the dealership, even though it was at 180,000 kilometers and technically they didn't have to give me a warranty on it, they did. Now, I probably could have taken them to court if they'd refused me and we could have had a huge drawn out argument about it and maybe I would have won and maybe I wouldn't have. Thankfully, I didn't have to do that. The dealership said, we will get the engine rebuilt for you. We're gonna do all of the work here in house to pull the motor out and take it to the rebuilder. They're gonna rebuild it and then we'll put the engine back in. The engine rebuilder was Jeff Kendrick, um, Kendrick Racing or Kendrick Automotive. I'm not sure what they go for with their engine rebuilding. And this whole process took about two months. So I bought the car, I'd had it a few weeks and then I was without the car for two months. Now, again, all credit due to the dealership, they gave me a loan car for this entire time. It was a red Hyundai i30, um, it was a brand new car. We put nearly 10,000 kilometers on it. Um, we really can't argue with that kind of service. Although it did suck because it was summer, we couldn't tow the jet ski, we couldn't put the jet ski in the water, we couldn't really go camping. In the end, we decided to stuff it all and go camping anyway. So we managed to get the 100 litre fridge and their swag into the i30 and we took it camping and actually it went really well. I did a video on it um, up there, I think. Eventually we got the car back. We got two or three exits down the freeway before we had issues with the throttle. 
Um, it was losing power. We turned around to head back, the engine light came on, and then just as we pulled up, the temperature started rising, the temperature started getting hot. So we had to hop back in the I-30 and do the 300 kilometers home while they tried to work out what was wrong. Apparently it was a simple fix. There was a combination of things. They didn't bleed the cooling system properly and there was air pockets in there. And they had also, I think, pinched the one of the temperature fuel sensor wires or something when they put the engine back in. Anyway, a week later we went and picked it up, had another go and everything was fine. We drove it around for a couple of weeks before we started spending any money on it because we had all of these uh, accessories that we purchased that were just sitting there waiting to go on it. And uh, eventually we, we figured, okay, well, we've got the stuff here. It seems to be working. Uh, let's start bolting stuff on. So we went ahead and bolted on lots of accessories. You know, this car is absolutely kitted out now and, and we've just been putting more and more on it ever since. And we'll go through some of those. I'm gonna do a walk around video uh, coming up soon just to show you how it's progressed in the couple of years that we've owned it so far. We did quite a few trips in it. We did quite a bit of towing, we towed a boat, towed a jet ski, um, some car trailers, and everything seemed to be going okay. After about seven or eight months, I noticed that there was a weep. Um, it wasn't dripping oil, but there was a weep. And um, you know, this was a little bit of a concern. Um, Toyotas don't generally leak oil, but you know, I, I thought, well, I've, I've got an engine rebuild out of this situation. I, I don't want to be too much of a pain and it's a 600 kilometer round trip to go and get looked at anyway. We'll monitor it and see how we go. You know, we've got a 12 month warranty on the engine. Well, coming up to the 10, 11 month mark, um, we started getting drips. Started dripping oil on the driveway and the catch can started to fill up. And um, well, it started to fill up quite a lot more quickly than it used to. Uh, now this is actually an important thing for future reference here. So the catch can that we had on there, um, we fitted pretty much the first day that we got it. Um, and it was a Ryko RC350, I think that's the model. They now do an RC351 and we'll get into that a little bit later. So the catch can was filling up quickly. Um, we had some oil leaks, quite a few oil leaks. They seem to be coming from the bottom of the motor in the center, like above the oil filter housing. I was thinking maybe a front crank seal or something. We also had leaks out of both rocker covers. Uh, the driver's side one was really bad. There was oil dripping down the side of it and actually dripping onto the ground. And the passenger side just had uh, a small weep. Um, it was just damp around the front corner. It was at this point that we decided to take the oil filler cap off and just have a look at how much blow by we were getting from the motor because we thought if it's leaking, maybe it's leaking because there's something wrong internally. And um, well, that didn't look good at all. So from what we saw with the blow by coming out of the oil filler cap, we made the assumption that the motor was knackered. Um, it looked like it had way too much blow by. We had oil leaks everywhere and we contacted the dealership and said, look, uh, here's videos, here's photos, something's wrong with this car. And they said they couldn't look at it for a month, but when everything reopened after Christmas, we could bring it up and I'd have a look at it for us. So we took it up there. Um, they sent me, uh, no, they, they gave me a phone call actually. They gave me a phone call and said that the uh, workshop manager had had a look at it and he agreed with us. He said the motor was stuffed. Uh, they were going to send it back to the engine rebuilder and could we leave the car with them, which we assumed would have to happen. There was another two months before we saw the car. And when we got it back, um, nothing had changed. Uh, in fact, it still had all the oil leaks. Uh, it still had the blow by and it was doing weird things at idle sometimes as well, just like a, almost like a, a half miss every now and then. So we were quite dismayed at this point and the uh, engine rebuilder, Jeff Kendricks, had um, denied that there was anything wrong with it. They said they'd done an oil usage test on it and that it was within the specifications. They said that even if it was under warranty, they weren't going to honor the warranty because um, we changed the exhaust. Like, 
we had a straight through exhaust on it. They also said that we were running 17 PSI of boost and that that was not standard. The factory boost they claimed was eight PSI. Um, I've got that in writing. Um, we've since confirmed with Toyota and on various forums that 17 PSI for a 2014 uh, 200 series is the factory boost level. But they claimed that we'd had the ECU remapped when we hadn't. They also said that it had been dusted, which we knew because that's how it had failed the first time. It hadn't been dusted since the rebuild though. The evidence that they claimed they saw, or the red dust in the snorkel and all this kind of nonsense, they took photographs of it and everything. Well, that was from the previous owner who did dust the motor. That's why it had low compression. We had not dusted the motor. They had claimed, they even said in writing that the vehicle had been up north and then it had pin down dust in it and that, that's why there were issues. Um, we hadn't been up north of it. In fact, we hadn't been north of Perth in it. And so that was also a load of crap. So to be honest, um, the service from them, uh, even though we were not their direct customer, which they were happy to point out to us, uh, was not very good. Um, they had the car for a week or so. Um, the dealership had it for a lot longer. Anyway, we got it back. The dealership did do a compression test for me on my request and the compression test actually came back good. So we were all very confused at that point. Anyway, we got the car back and we figured, well, if the compression test is okay, then we must just have regular oil leaks. It doesn't explain why we're getting the blow by and why the catch can's filling up but maybe it's just a, a half-assed rebuild and maybe it's still in Toyota spec, so maybe we just have to live with that. Anyway, I took it to my local mechanic, Bustle and Automotive, and Trent, the owner there, um, replaced the driver's side rocker cover for me, the rocker cover gasket for me. And he said that the rocker cover gasket was folded over when it was installed last time, and that's why it was leaking out of there so badly. He took photos of that for me. Um, when I contacted Jeff Kendrick about that, he said they don't put the rocker covers on, that gets done when the engine's installed, so it was the dealership, so I contacted the dealership and they went halves with me in the cost of replacing that rocker cover gasket. So here I was, still not very confident in the car, I took it for its first trip away and we went down to Mum's farm, I got about two, two and a half hours out of, uh, from home, middle of the night, middle of nowhere and I overtook a car and a caravan going up a hill and it wasn't long after that I started to smell oil, like burning oil. So I pulled over and sure enough, it had dropped its guts again, there was oil everywhere. So now I was really quite upset. We monitored the oil usage and we, you know, we got back to Perth and we didn't, we didn't use too much oil on the dipstick so it was uh, obviously not hemorrhaging as quite as bad as it looked. You don't need a lot of oil coming out to make a mess. So we took it back to Trent and this time I was upset with Trent and I thought, Trent, you know, you, you, you've done a really poor job here. It's all coming out of the injectors around the, around the rocker cover and uh, he's had a look at it and he's come back to me and said, who put your catch can in? And I said, um, well, originally it was the mechanic that uh, reseeded the injectors, uh, injector lines when, when it first failed. And then the second time it was the dealership when they put the motor back in. And he said, well, we've bypassed it and um, you're not getting uh, any problems anymore. Your catch can was causing massive amounts of restriction um, so this explained why we were getting the blow-by, or seemingly blow-by, out of the oil cap and why we were getting oil leaks from everywhere and potentially even why it was having that weird miss at idle. So that led me on to researching a little bit more about this Ryko RCC350 catch can. And it turns out that I'm not the first person to have experienced a problem like this. It seemed to have happened with Mitsubishi's not with 200 series, but they had very similar problems. And according to these people on these forums, 
When they contacted RICO about this issue, RICO said to them, try taking out the one-way valve at the top of the catch can. These people also claimed that RICO have released a new model, the RCC351, which I've Googled and you can buy. They don't specify what the differences in them are, but I've been led to believe by these forum posts, and this is just going on the information that I found online, that the 351 doesn't have the check valve or the one-way valve in the top, and pretty much that's the only difference. So, I removed this check valve. It's got a little O-ring here, a big seal here, and two springs here that go on the top of the filter. Now, just to be safe, and because of the exorbitant prices of the filters too, I've also removed the filter now. I know that that kind of defeats half of the reason of having that catch can in there, but it still works as a catch can. Some old school catch cans don't have filters either. It, the way that the air goes in the bottom and comes out the top with a curved sort of um, outlet does mean that it, it does still actually catch a reasonable amount of oil. I still get oil in my drain tube, um, you know, every thousand k's or so, reasonable amount. So obviously the cruiser is still breathing and they are renowned for breathing, but it seems to be quite manageable and now I'm not getting all of that pressure when I take the oil filler cap off and my oil leaks have all miraculously gone away. Now Trent is a legend, he's worked that out. He, um, he did everything for a very fair price and uh, he was really good throughout the whole exercise. And what Trent did was work out what the car dealer and the engine rebuilder should have worked out as soon as they saw it. Really, when you speak to mechanics and you say, these are the problems that I've got, the first thing they say to me is, oh, did you have a catch can? I say, yes. Oh, well, you need to check that first. Now, why a car dealership who thinks that they can pull a VDJ out of a 200 series and replace it again, and why a racing company who rebuilds engines can't see that there's a catch can and say, hey, maybe we should just bypass that and check to see if that's causing all of the problems, is a mystery to me. I don't understand why they wouldn't have done that when my local mechanic, it's the first thing that they've done. So anyway, my Ryko catch can now does have not have a check valve or a filter in it, and the car seems to be working beautifully. So, did the engine blow up? No. What was the cause? Check valve in a Ryko RCC350 catch can. So what did Ryko have to say about this? I contacted Ryko, I sent them photographs, I sent them the invoice from my mechanic that had all of this stuff explained on it. They asked me if the dipstick had come out. I said no. My mechanic says he's seen this before and the O-rings around the injectors generally pop out first. They're only pressed in and they come out very easily. Once the pressure's been relieved through there, the dipstick doesn't come out. It took them a really long time to reply to me on both occasions. Then they just said, we would like you to send the catch can to us so that our engineers can look at it. That was it. There was no, we'll send you a new one, we'll send you the updated model, send us the old one back, or we'll send you a bag, or we'll pay for the postage, or anything. It was just, send it back to us. It wasn't even a please, there was nothing. It was really, it was quite rude actually, I thought. So I, Follow the advice on the internet and I pulled out the check valve and the filter because I'm not going to be paying Ryko for these $100 filters. What a rip off. Seems to be working okay. I'll probably put a pro vent in at some point down the track, but right now it's working. There's no restriction in there and everything seems to be good. So at the end of the day, I probably wouldn't be putting a Ryko catch can on my Land Cruiser or any turbo diesel or any car actually I wouldn't be touching them. The 351 is probably okay but there's nothing from Ryko to say that they've resolved the problem with the 351 from the 350. They haven't admitted to there being a problem. I don't know how many other cars are out there getting ruined potentially from too much crankcase pressure from the 350 check valve failing and causing problems. So what do you do? I guess uh, I'm just grateful the car's working. 
I'm happy that it's not using any excessive oil anymore. The catch can's not filling up anymore. Uh, I'm assuming the catch can was filling up because there was just, it was completely blocked and it wasn't allowing any of the vapor through at all. Um, even with a filter, you're still gonna get some oil vapor coming through the, uh, the filter and going into the engine, into the crankcase. So I'm assuming that when you block that up totally, it probably puts more oil into the, into the catch can itself. And I guess having that high crankcase pressure probably creates more slippage through the rings. I don't know, I'm not a mechanical engineer, but um, since we've freed up that restriction, the oil usage of the car has dropped significantly. So I'd say that um, that's pretty much solved all of the problems that I had with it. Anyway, the Land Cruiser is running. We have gone and put even more modifications onto it. And we've got another really big announcement. If you're on my Instagram, you would have already probably seen photos of it. We've got a very big purchase that we've uh, gone and committed to and have also been doing a lot of modifications on as well. So we'll be bringing you some videos on those shortly. Anyway, I know this wasn't the most exciting video ever, but it's got some really important information, especially if you're considering putting a catch can on your 200 series. I certainly wouldn't be using a Ryko product myself from my experience. I would probably only use a Provent and that's because everybody on the Land Cruiser forums uses Provent and they don't seem to cause any problems. When you're talking about a $30,000 motor, just put on something you know that works. All right, thanks guys. I'll catch you in the next video.